So yeah, okay, great. So the next, this is, um, we've got this week and next week is a bit of a, a two-part series and we will touch upon, although I won't dwell on, but we'll touch upon some of the things that we discussed already in the previous um, course prior to Shavuot, the one that was leading up to, um, leading up to um, Shavuot, where we spoke about how to, how to prepare for Yom Tov and those sorts of things. And we touched on some of these things. Uh, so it might be a bit of a repeat for those of you who are there, uh, but I will, well, there's quite a lot to get through. But it's a two-part series, um, and it's on, on uh, Shabbat. And we'll look at tonight, what we'll look at is um, preparation for Shabbat, Friday night in terms of the davening and the meal. And then next week, we'll look at Shabbat day. It's just otherwise too much to try and roll in um, into one. Um, let's just put a bit of a, just mute people. And I'm just going to mute people. If you want to unmute them, by all means, just unmute yourself. I think I've allowed those to unmute if you want to um, interrupt or, or ask, a, ask a question. Okay, so um, it's very interesting because I think many people, your, your probably experienced this as well, um, many people have lost track sometimes of what day of the week it is. Um, in fact, the other, the other week, my son uh, had actually said the wrong psalm for the day. He got so lost in which day of the week it is because when you don't go out and when you're not going to school or you're not going to shul or when you're not going to work, then you do lose a bit of a sense of you don't have your routine in that way where you know it's the next day in whatever way in whatever way it is that can't happen in a way from a jewish perspective even though as i, as I demonstrated it even can in that but it's less it's less easy to do that because as part of our prayers we have a psalm for the day which hopefully reminds us every day which day it is but also um shabbos comes in this uh, as well and the and, and our rabbis understood uh, the the commandment of where it says, Zachar Esyama Shabbos Lekacha, remember the Shabbos day and sanctify it. Um, that is an obligation not only to remember Shabbos on the seventh day, but actually to be aware each day of the week what day it is relative to Shabbos. And that's why the psalm for the day as part of our prayer says, um, today is the third day from Shabbos or fourth day or whatever it, whatever it may be. And, the, and as I said, for some people, the last few months have been very challenging in that way. It's almost been like it, it's been Shabbos for a few months. There's no travel. There's no going to the office. There's more time with family um, and generally less going on. So it's been, you know, one long Shabbos-like experience for many, many people. Uh, and so, you know, when we're not schwitzing in the same way as before at work and away from home, we may think, well, is it really necessary to have Shabbos in the way that we did before? What's fascinating is I came across um, a, uh, we shared this, but I came and I shared this in the, in the summary for those, who, I'll send the summary, but th that this is not the first time the Jews have had this question because there was a 16th century rabbi, his name is Ramosha of Trani, who discusses the Jews in Egypt. And he says that the Jews who left Egypt had similar thoughts because he, he, he quotes a teaching from the rabbis that the Jews kept Shabbos while they were in Egypt. Um, and yet when they were in the den, this is, um, Moses had instituted this. He, he he pleaded with Pharaoh to allow them to have one day rest. And so there was already, Shabbos already existed before the giving of the Torah in Egypt. They had this idea of one day rest. And so when they were in the desert, they were commanded to keep Shabbos, as we know, right? So he says, you know, why did Hashem need to command them about something they were already observing? They, 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 they were already keeping Shabbos and they knew about it. And he says, he answers that the Jews may have assumed that Shabbos in Egypt was important because it was in contrast to the six days that they were slaving away and therefore they needed a Shabbat. But here in the desert, when they weren't slaving away in the same way, they weren't working, they weren't toiling, everything was provided for them. It was one, in a way, the desert for them was one long Shabbat. God took care of everything. They didn't need to worry about anything. We'll come to some of the more the details uh, soon. But they may have thought, I don't need Shabbat, right? And so therefore there was a special in, instruction to keep Shabbat there in that context. And so, also, in the context that we have now, it's important to appreciate that even if our work week hasn't been the same intensity in terms of the traveling and, and, and other aspects of it, um, Shabbos still um, is not only about what we're not allowed to do, but it's also what it enables us to do. And that's what we'll focus on um, as, as well. Because, and you've heard this from me before, too often I feel Shabbos gets a lot of bad press, meaning it, 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 it association is undesirable restriction. It's about what we're not allowed to do. I'm restricted from this, I'm restricted from that, I'm not allowed to do this, I'm not allowed to do that. But interestingly, when we perceive either a customer or a law as restrictive, that's not necessarily a true perception because it, it will very often depend on 
what a person's state of mind. So anybody with teenagers, either in the past, present, or future, certainly in the past or the present, will know and appreciate that, um, you know, telling a teenager not to do something, for example, not to bring their phone to the table at dinner time, um, you know, with us or with whoever it may be, may be viewed as an undesirable restriction, right? They may see that as, as an undesirable restriction. But at the same time, really what it is, is about enabling them to have a better qualitative interaction with the people around them. So it, it's, but, but they, will, they won't necessarily appreciate that. They can, they can eventually appreciate it, either when they grow up or when they take a few moments to think about it or experience it and say, oh, actually, that was quite nice, we interacted, or whatever it may be. If you understand the point that I'm making, and we have that in our, every, in our everyday life. A similar um, analogy that I came across is, is the GPS model, um, where, um, you know, if you've got a navigation system and the navigation system says, turn left, and ahead of you, you see this beautifully lined um, street of, in, uh, with trees, beautifully lined with, with gorgeous trees, you may think, what do you mean to tell me to turn left? If I carry on straight on, it's like a gorgeous road and there's beautiful views and there's hills on the side. But, but, but actually, that's not going to take me the right place. So it's all about perception. It's all about the way that we, that we see things. I'm just going to share my screen because I've got a, um, now that hopefully I've got strong bandwidth, I, I've got a, a PowerPoint that I can share with you as we go along just to, to help focus in on um, some things that we, that, that just some key points that I'm talking about. So we'll get to uh, the preparation a little, a little bit into this. So that's really um, what, I, what I, I think the context by which I want to talk about tonight, and that is the idea of no law or regulation is objectively restrictive, right? It all depends on A, whether this regulation enables you to do something special, and B, whether the affected people perceive it. So if I perceive it to be restrictive, then it will be, but that's my perception. If it enables me, if a no enables a yes, that's really not a, that's not a restriction then. It's actually uh, enabling us to have a, a better, and that's, the, that's really the job of every Jew, to try and learn and appreciate what the restrictions enable us to do, and, what, and that's what I'd like to share with you tonight, some examples of what some of the restrictions actually enable us and free us up to be able to focus on and to be able to do. As I said, tonight we'll look at Friday night effectively, or Friday at day and night, and next week we'll look at the uh, Shabbat day itself. So preparation, well, an important part of Shabbos, uh, right, Shabbos of the observant, and the truth is an important part of anything in life, is preparation. I seem to recall last time I shared with you the, uh, from my friend where his father would say, if you don't, he would share, would share with him that if you um, don't, um, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. It's one of the most fabulous lines I've, I've heard, certainly as an educator and, and in education, yeah? if you, um, uh, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. And so this, it's the same thing with anything like, but I like to apply this to the Shabbos, um, uh, Shabbos experience. And there are several things pertaining to Shabbos that take, that make preparation necessary. So one is um, the idea of work. There are activities that we are forbidden to do on Shabbos, right? So like turning on the air conditioning or the lights or whatever it may be. So therefore there is it's necessary to prepare on Friday in advance to make sure that which I'm not going to be able to do is I, I, I prepare in advance on Friday to make sure that I have the lights on that I need or whatever it is that it may be that needs to be prepared because of the things I'm not allowed to do on Shabbos. There is a second element, so that's a bait on a basic, a straightforward level. There's a second element, which is about uh, one stage uh, above that, is about uh, what we call Oneg Shabbos, the enjoyment, the enjoyment of Shabbos, right? The pleasure of Shabbos. We are obligated to experience the pleasure of Shabbos. And that includes, a big part of that is eating, as we know. And therefore, because we're not allowed to cook on Shabbos, we need to prepare the dishes before um, uh, uh, before Shabbos, and that is we have no choice but to prepare in order to have a more pleasurable um, Shabbos. And the third thing, going one stage even above that, is the idea of covered, of honor of Shabbos, right? In, 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 in Jewish tradition, Shabbos is viewed, as we, as we know from our davening, we'll come to it a little bit later, as um, Shabbos, Michael, the, the queen, with the analogy that's given is a royalty, Shabbos is royalty. And um, as, as is a lot in Judaism, a lot of in spirituality as well, which is why very often in shul, the colors that are chosen are royal colors, you know, that, that, those, sort of, those sort of ideas. And so we have to prepare ourselves um, and our homes in order to sort of um, be ready for the arrival of um, royalty, or arrival of the queen, which is, you know, Shabbos Malkus or Shabbos the queen, as, as we see, we'll see soon. 
And so, especially because of this last factor, the idea of, of honor, it's important that we seek out opportunities to personally prepare for Shabbos that, that, and that we don't rely on others to get things, to get things done. There, there's a, the, um, there are texts actually that we have, but we don't have time to go through them, but they, there is a series of examples in the Talmud where you know, the greatest of rabbis would do the most menial of tasks in order to prepare for Shabbos, you know, cleaning the, the, cleaning the house and sweeping and whatever it may be that otherwise they may, they may not do that. And, you know, some people never do that, but you wouldn't, you know, I'll never forget a colleague of mine who was you know, somebody in a rabbi in America. He shared with me a story where he was taking out the rubbish one, one I think it was Friday afternoon, whatever, maybe one evening. And then a colleague of his had rolled down the window. It was Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg actually in, in, uh, in LA, rolled down the windows. Um, and stopped and uh, said to him, uh, Rabbi, um, you know, you, like, you shouldn't be taking out the rubbish. So he said, are you going to come and take it out for me? As in like, if I don't do it, what, so I should rely on somebody, my wife doing it? Like, at home, that, that, you know, that I've got to do things. That, that's part of the way that these things work. And certainly in terms of preparing for Shabbos, we shouldn't see anything as in uh, unbecoming. Because ultimately, if it's preparing for Shabbos, there is no person on earth who is above um, sort of Shabbos and, and, and therefore the holiness and spirituality of Shabbos and so preparing in that way giving honor is in, and involving ourselves in the preparation shows respect of Shabbos and therefore the more we do the better uh, the better it is and as I said the, the Talmud speaks about this. Now the primary preparations for Shabbos are on Friday um, where possible and where we can um, and that's because it's, it's more apparent that we're preparing for Shabbos. Obviously where it's not possible and can't cook everything on the Friday then we do it before but one should try um, and do it on um, on Shabbos, and we have a text um, coming up just to break it up. Here we go. Let's see. Um, uh, any, anybody? Any volunteers? Um, who's going first? Simon, go on. One should rise early on. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, listen. One should rise early on Friday to prepare what is needed for Shabbat, even if you have many servants. Find something small to do for the honor of Shabbat. We see this with Rav Chisa, who would cut vegetables finely, Rabba and Rav Yosef, who would chop wood, Rabbi Ziera, who would light the flame, Rav Nachman, who would clean the house and replace the wheat with cutlery designated for Shabbat. We can emulate them. One should not say it is unbecoming of me for this is the honor of Shabbat. So this is, thank you, Simon. So this is not, this is the reinforced fact that it's just not me saying it. This is actually, a, this is the code of Jewish law. This is the of It's codified in Jewish law that that's what we um, should be, we should be doing. Now, um, the other thing that we do that is very, very, very much sort of one of the um, quintessential preparations of Shabbat, if that's the right term, um, is baking of challah. The association we're talking about what, what when we're talking about preparing for Shabbat, baking of challah has got to be the classic when we talk about um, the association of Shabbat preparation, Shabbat preparations. Um, now, interestingly, when we use in our daily conversations the, the, the term challah, that refers to the loaves of bread that we traditionally eat on Shabbat. But of course, um, uh, challah itself in rabbinic literature and in, in the Torah, we had it just last week in the last week's parasha, the term challah refers to the small portion of dough that we separate out when we bake any bread. When we're making a large enough amount, then you separate out, and, and in temple times, that was considered holy. You had to give it to the Kohen, the priest, and only he could consume it, because that's what the Torah says, that from the first portion of your dough, you shall give a gift to God, and uh, they were the representatives of God, and you, you gave it to them. Um, and that was what was done. Nowadays, that's uh, not possible, so there's various customs. Some people burn it, leave it in the oven and, and, and burn it and, and let it burn to the point at which it's not edible and then throw it away. Or one uh, wrap like with other things, as I mentioned last week or the week before about bread, um, one wraps it up and then throws it away and, and uh, dis um, uh, uh, disposes of it because you actually can't eat, you're not allowed to eat it. I think the, the important thing here is for us for tonight to understand that the, some of the insights and the meaning is that this reminds us to sort of, if, if dough represents a staple diet, basic food and nourishment, it reminds us that we take some away and we sort of curb this unrelenting desire to obtain more and more. What we have, we take some away and we say, I have plenty, I can even separate out something, some of it for somebody else, in this case, for a spiritual purpose. And that's the other part of it. We're saying that what I want to do, and I, we spoke about this in the last couple of weeks, 
what I want to do is use my food for a spiritual purpose. And at the first opportunity, when I'm just making the dough, I'm going to separate some out and say, this is holy. And therefore, the continuation of the rest of what I eat when I bake it and eat it would also be for a holy purpose, which is very important. So it's about giving. Um, well, that was about preparation. It's, a, it's about giving, which is very, very uh, important. And though, of course, today we're, we're blessed to be able to buy ready-made chalas, and which is great for those that need to. In the past, that wasn't as common. Um, but certainly Jewish women have traditionally embraced that custom of baking challah um, for Shabbos and allowing them the opportunity to perform this special uh, mitzvah, which is particularly, I think, relevant now to so many of us who are, you know, who mind the pun, but are needing to relax. Is that it? Good, good. Um, so, um, and, that, and I think that's, that, that's important to appreciate that and, 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 and to understand it. Now, in terms of other elements of preparation, so we have, you know, the, the usual things of making a point of, of, of cleaning the house. And so traditionally, Jewish, you know, cleaners of Jewish homes would, you know, Friday is always a tough day to get a cleaner because you have to find a good cleaner. Usually, you should, people share them around and then it's first come, first serve. The ones that get there first can get them for the Friday. And then the next best thing is the third day. You know, you work your way backwards. But Friday is always the worth the time that we want our cleaners to come because that we're ready. We're ready for Shabbos, and that's really very important. The, 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 again, and this is taken from um, Shulchan. I didn't bring the text because we don't have enough time. But the continuation of that text we saw before actually mentions these items. Um, so these are not my examples. These are examples from the code of the Shulchan Aruch, code of Jewish law, making beds, and the other one which we're very familiar with is, is laying. Uh, is having a tablecloth as a minimum on the table and certainly laying the table as we'll come to soon also in advance is uh, um, a special significance and these are things that are mentioned specifically in in the code of jewish law um and um we'll discuss um ne ne next week things that we need to make sure that we prepare things that we need for for, the, for shabbos day um it, it itself so that's about the home the other aspect of it that, that, that the halacha talks about is how we prepare ourselves um for um, for Shabbos. So uh, again, making uh, the, the mentions about showering, cutting our nails, um, and, 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 and cutting our nails is interesting because there are some circumstances in which there are special exemptions given. Usually there are some times where it's restricted to cut our nails, but it's saying the honor of Shabbos you can. But we see it's not, it's not just a straightforward thing of, of, of normal day life. It's, there's a special significance of making a point of, of cutting our nails um, for Shabbos, um, taking a haircut if necessary, and getting um, and getting dressed in our Shabbos clothes, which is it, which is um, you know very important. And in fact, some people, um, I mean, Halacha talks about having at least some item that is of clothing that's designated as Shabbos clothing that you would not wear other than Shabbos. Some people have uh, a custom to only have clothes that are wear that they they have a set of clothes only for Shabbos. They wear on Shabbos Shabbos clothes um, only. Um, which if one's able to do that, that's a lovely and a very special thing. And it makes us, you know, we, we know what it's like. You put on a certain outfit, it makes you feel a certain way. And we, if we have an outfit and clothing that is designated for Shabbos, by putting those on, it impacts and affects the way we think and the way we feel about what we're about to do and, um, and about Shabbos in general, which is very, uh, very important. And all of these things about, we think about when we're, um, you know, when we're going to greet somebody or, or welcome somebody into our home, we do a lot of these things to you know, get our home and ourselves ready for that when we're having guests over. And so we should see Shabbos, even if we're not having guests over. And there's a little interesting, I'll share with you, there's a, a, a discussion uh, with the government's announcement today um, about whether it means from 4th of July, because you're allowed another household, can and should um, rabbinic families now return to doing uh, Shabbat hospitality. So it's an interesting conversation, interesting discussion. Um, uh, and whether that should be encouraged, discouraged, if, if, the, if the rabbinic couple or families want to do it. And those, so the idea of welcoming guests, we haven't had for a few months, and it could be, and it may be, that if we don't have guests, we may prepare for Shabbos differently. And I think what I'm trying to reinforce is that we should imagine that we've always got guests because we've got Shabbos as the guest. Shabbos is the guest that we're going to welcome, and we have to prepare accordingly and make it, and respect Shabbos and make it special and beautiful, regardless of the fact that we may not have physical guests. In, in, in that way. Um, one of the other, so making challah and preparing for Shabbos in that way with, is, is certainly a classic. The other classic is Shabbos candles, right? The association of sort of preparing and welcoming in the Shabbos, Shabbos candles. And I touched upon this when we looked at lighting Yom Tov candles before Shavuot. So I won't, I won't really dwell on this, uh, but just to reinforce the significance of it about bringing in light 
and because the world began with light so we go back to that first bit of creation and we bring in light um, and uh, which is one of the reasons why it's become um, so special in the interest of time I'm just going to sort of skip this uh, this section on, on candles which I'm sure we're very familiar if anybody isn't please do be in touch with me separately let's move on therefore to um, the, 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 the davening the prayers so having pr prepared for Shabbos in that way prepared the food and got ourselves ready got the home ready got ourselves ready and lit the Shabbos candles um, but by, by the way there is one thing I want to mention about Shabbos candles is that um, we light candles approximately 15 minutes before some some have the custom 80 minutes and must be aware that the United Synagogue times are 15 minutes before the actual time of Shabbos there's a bit of a buffer that's given there um, and so candle lighting times is um, we, we, if we didn't like it just then there still is Approximately 13 to 15 minutes. If you lose 13 minutes, you're definitely safe. After which, if we just didn't manage to get ready in time, regardless of how much time we had, it's always a challenge. Um, then we've still got a bit of a buffer there. So we're now at Friday night, and um, there are. Let's talk about the prayers before we talk about the meal. So there are three standard. Um, yeah. Oh, the other the other important element. Sorry, I know I said I was going to skip it, but the other very important element, particularly particularly this time of year, is you cannot do it too early. So there is a latest time by which you can light the candles, obviously, which is the time Shabbat absolutely comes in. However, you also can't do it too early. You're not allowed to light candles more than an hour and a quarter before sunset. Now, an hour and a quarter doesn't mean 75 minutes. It's the minutes apportioned by the day. So you see this little um, uh, thing on the left. Um, at the bottom, it's got a proportional hour based on daylight hours. At the moment, we're at the, practically the longest days, which means if sun, you see if sunset um, at the moment is about nine, I, I didn't use the current one because this was put together by somebody else and enough time to replace it, but if sunset is uh, approximately what, 9.30 or so, approximately 9.30. So um, in fact, I'll just quickly look up on my timings on my phone quickly, one second. I'll give you an example of what I mean. So um, this coming Shabbat, um, the latest candle lighting time is 9.22, but you cannot light candles before 7.38. 7.38, which is quite a late time. Bearing in mind, for example, it's very practical because bearing in mind in the summertime, we would dub and go to Shul at whatever, 7.15 on a Friday night. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be allowed to either light candles or, by the way, Daven Mariv before 7.38. Now, because we daven at 7.15ish, so we're usually okay with that. Um, we're usually okay with that. But it, um, it, it, at the height of the summer, it's an important thing to be, to, to be aware of, that there is an earliest time, which actually is quite late. So lighting candles anywhere before 7.38 this time Friday night is completely invalid and doesn't satisfy the obligation of lighting cand candles for, for the purposes of, of, of Shabbos. In other words, you can't make a blessing. You know, you're not allowed to make a blessing on the lighting of candles if it's any time before 7.38 at the moment. It starts creeping earlier as the weeks go by. And that's why in the time, one of the things I introduced when I came to Southampton was also, was also an earliest time. I don't know if it still is in the, um, in, in the, in, in the Shamas. I've, I've not been involved in this for a bit now. But um, there, was, or there used to be certainly an earliest candle lighting time to make sure that we, we were aware of this. Anyway, I digress a little bit, but it's very, in a very important and relevant point at this moment in time. So those are the candles, um, the obligation, men and women. Um, the custom is for women, but men still have the obligation. And, and the custom is also that men prepare it. So they should be involved in it. And the men should prepare the candles ready to be lit. That way it's a combined effort and it's for the home. But the women have the custom to like, yes, Simon. Sorry, does that mean a man shouldn't light the candles? Correct. Um, I.e., unless the woman says you go and light it, but the custom tradition is that it's, a, it, it's something that was given to the women as their, um, as their mitzvah. And if there's no women around? Yeah, then, then of course a man does. Yeah, absolutely. Then a man does. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, if somebody, if either not around or, 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 or I because they're away or because they don't, there is no woman around, they're single. Um, then, uh, but then the man has the obligation to get that okay. um, In the picture, there are three yeah. candles. Yes, ah, so, okay, so that's because the tradition is you have two candles, the, the woman of the home lights two candles, what, because there are two terms for Shabbos, remember and guard, and so we remember the two of each of those. 
Um, and then there is a custom and practice for God. By the way, it was an ancient custom that, interestingly, it was discovered because of shortages of candles during the war, it, it fell out of, of practice. But girls from around the age of three would light their own candle as well. So the reason why there's a third candle is because it's the little girl's candle, which she lit just before the mother lit her candles. And therefore, they're, they're, doing, they're making the blessing together. Um, and this is just about where you should put them um, and uh, make sure it's safe, etc., etc. We'll just see if that side of things. Okay. Um, some other things we should do it in yeah, The other, the other element of it is that the the practice is to give tzedakah just before we light the candles. Um, wave our hands, cover our eyes. These are the practices of how you do it. If I had more time, I'd go to more detail, but hopefully, um, and, and I'm sure you're all familiar. Okay. Let's look at the prayers. Some up prayers. Okay. So on Friday night, we have, so generally there are three standard prayers, right, that we have every day. Um, the third of which is Ma'ariv, the nighttime prayer. On Friday evening, we have a section before Ma'ariv, which is the evening prayer, called Kabbalat Shabbat, which is the welcoming of Shabbat. We have a series of psalms, um, at, at the end of which we have L'Chadadi, I'm going to come to that in a moment, but we have a series of six psalms, um, uh, that is, that's for the welcoming of, um, of Shabbos. Uh, and this, they have a theme. There are three themes in these psalms. One is the sort of the God's dominion over nature, um, which is uh, we, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be more conscious of this on, on Shabbos, right? That's the idea. So they've had that theme. Uh, there's a theme of joy and happiness, which we said there's a big, there's an imperative to, to enjoy and have pleasure over Shabbos. So therefore, this is a theme. And the third one is the future redemption, which we say we get a taste of over Shabbos. Shabbos is for me'ain olam haba. It gives us a taste of the world to come and spirituality. The other element of this, which is interesting, by the way, we have six because they represent the six days of the week. And that's why we have six psalms leading up to L'Chadodi, where we start singing about, about Shabbos. Um, the other element of this is if you were to take the first letter, this is the Hebrew letter, of those six psalms, the numerical value of that is 430. If you take the word soul, which is nefesh in Hebrew, on the Shammah, on the Shammah, also nefesh, it's 430. So these six psalms allude to the fact that on Shabbos we're given a extra soul. What does an extra soul mean? So Kabbalah explains that an extra soul doesn't mean we've got two souls. We had one before and we now have two. But actually another dimension to our soul, the soul being spiritual, has multiple levels. And, and um, the deeper levels are normally concealed during the week. And, then, and less influential. And on Shabbos, that deeper level of the soul is revealed and it results in a sort of more passionate and internal connection to God. And that's the meaning of an extra, an extra soul. We tap into a deeper dimension of our, of our souls. Right? And that's the idea of a, of a Shabbos soul and why we feel a little bit more spiritual on that day. The sixth Psalm, by the way, um, which we're very familiar with, um, we, we sing it, the one that we sing all together. Right, so that one. So that has um, God's name 18 times, and in the words God's voice, koil, the word koil is mentioned uh, seven times, and that corresponds to the seven days of creation during which God used his voice, i.e., speech, to create everything that's in existence. So there's allusions there to creation, and we're reminding ourselves about what, you know, the background of what's, what's happened. So before reciting um, the psalm that corresponds to Shabbos, which we'll see soon, we sing L'Chadodi. I think it, it, it would be worthwhile just focusing on this a little bit and understanding L'Chadodi. So this very beautiful, powerful, uplifting um, L'Chadodi is a, a poem, not a psalm, it's effectively a poem that was written by a 16th century Kabbalist of Shlomo Akabetz. And um, for those of you who are familiar with Hebrew, you'll see his name, it's an acrostic. His name is actually there. Uh, did I have the second one in the, no, you don't have the second, but the rest of it is, you see in the beginning in the bold, Shlomo, Shin Lam and Meme Shlomo, and the rest of it is Halevi. But his name was Shlomo Halevi al Kabbat. He used his name as an acrostic for this Um uh, And the chorus of this refers to Shabbat as a bride. And this is what I was referring to before. L'chadodi, Likras Kala, come my beloved to meet the bride. And it refers to this sort of intimacy and closeness that we have with God, with Hashem on Shabbos it, itself, just as a bride is united with a, with a, with a groom. And that's, that, that's a significant. And that's in a way why it has this sort of su such power because of its, its meaning and what it's there to rep represent. Following um, uh, L'chadodi, we, we then say the psalm that is, um, oh, what, no, that's further ahead. Following L'chadodi, we say psalm uh, for, uh, for Shabbos. 
um, uh, and Mesma Sheli Yama Shabbos, uh, and then that concludes the um, Kabbalah, the section which is known as uh, Kabbalat Shabbat, uh, uh, welcoming the Shabbat, and then it's followed by the evening prayers. Now, um, this Mizmo Shirli, Yom HaShabbat, is, is significant because that's the point at which those who are davening accept Shabbos. So for, for those who are lighting candles, be it women or men, if you light candles, you accept Shabbos at, that, at the lighting of the candle. However, if you're davening, then the, the, the start of Shabbos is, if it's earlier than the absolute start time. So for example, if Shabbos comes in at 9.22 and you're davening at 8 o'clock, right? Then, and again, you can't actually welcome Shabbos any, any earlier than 7.38. So if you're davening at 8 o'clock, then by saying the Ms. Moshe, that's the acceptance of Shabbos. And that's why for many of the online, you know, um, Kabbalat Shabbat services, they stop at that point because that's when you accept Shabbos. After the Chazadji, they stop because you're accepting Shabbos by saying Ms. Moshe, Yom Shabbos. If you're doing it earlier, then you can't accept Shabbos earlier, so it's irrelevant. If you're doing it after the, 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 you know, the one and a quarter hours before sunset, then you, you cannot say Ms. Mashir online because you're accepting Shabbos and then you're online. It doesn't work. So there's a class I'll share with you again, just an insight, some of the things that we're considering. Fascinating questions being raised. For many communities, we're going to continue online live streaming when we go into shul. It's going to be a, a hybrid, right? Now, can we continue to stream Kabbalat Shabbat from shul? And at what point, if we can, what point do you switch it off? And, you know, these, these questions where you've got a both and, how does it, how do they interact? And it's some of these, these are some of the questions that we're considering and have to sort of give guidance to communities about and questions that are, that are coming in. So that's uh, an introduction, uh, not an introduction, sorry, a, a background to um, uh, Kabbalat Shabbat, to, uh, to, to, to the extra bits that we do for preparing Shabbat, to welcoming Shabbat in the davening, in the davening that we do. Um, and then we have Mariv, uh, and then we have our meal. So let's look at the meal again. Uh, some of these things I touched upon in a previous session, um, but they, they do bear repeating, and uh, there's some other bits I didn't cover, uh, and so on, and we talk about the meal. So after we've, we've, we've toughened, um, we have the, the Shabbat meal. So where are we here? Yeah, okay. Right, Shalom Aleichem. Right, Shalom Aleichem um, is uh, a 17th century poem. We're by, composed by an unknown author. We actually don't know who composed it, which is quite incredible considering that this is such a classic Jewish custom and practice. Um, there are varying customs as to how many a practice, how many times you say it. Some people have a practice to say it twice, to repeat each stanza twice. Some have the, have it, uh, have the practice uh, three times. Um, the reason for this is goes to the heart of why it is that we sing this lovely song on Friday night in the first place. Now the Talmud and the Zahar, in fact, um, teach us that angels accompany us at this time and bless the family upon seeing the house prepared for Shabbos. Now, when we talk about angels, it says that Talmud says, says that there are two angels that accompany us. And therefore, we talk about welcoming, right? Shalom Aleichem is we, we welcome these angels um, uh, and we say it in the plural. And therefore, we repeat it twice, i.e. one to each of them. Those who have the custom to say it three times is because in addition to the two angels we have for Friday night, each and every one of us have a ministering angel and a guardian angel, whatever one wants to call, or wants to call them. And therefore, when we're talking to angels, we want to include them as well in this welcoming of them when we're talking to angels. And that's why some people have the custom and practice to do it um, three times. The last thing we say is, um, um, we say that you should... Uh, um, you, you come and also we, we basically say to them you should go in peace. So we've got Shalom Aleichem. Okay, so here let's let's read a bit of text. Um, let's have a volunteer for a bit of text. Give my voice a bit of a rest. Okay. Michael, thank you, Michael. Yeah. yeah. When we return from the synagogue, angels accompany us on each side while the divine presence hovers above us and the angels. If we enter our homes with joy and receive guests with joy. And if upon arrival, the angels and the divine presence see the candles lit, the table set, and the husband and wife both joyous, at that moment, the divine presence says, this is mine, Israel, in which I take pride. It's a lovely, lovely thought and lovely, lovely sort of image um, for that, you know, when we're singing Shalom Aleichem, this is what it is. Now, one of the things that we say in Shalom Aleichem, I'll we'll come to Eshachan in a minute, is that we, we say in the final stanza, we say, may your departure 
be in peace. Seitchem l'shalom. Right? May your departure be in peace. And many have wondered, like, why are we saying that? Why do we want them to go? Like, surely the angels should stay with us throughout the meal and the whole of Friday night. We've worked all, all you know, all this. We've worked to this point. And then let them continue to stay here. It should be a nice thing. But one explanation, which I can't remember, which is very beautiful, is that the angels gather at, at, in our home to take part in our, our holiness. However, Shabbos, the Shabbos meal itself, the meal itself, starting with Kiddush, is actually an intimate time when sort of the bride and groom, the metaphoric bride and groom, i.e. Hashem and the Jewish people, dine together. And that's private time. Even angels can't be there. Our own personal angels, of course, but the other accompanying angels say, you know what, thank you for accompanying us. Thank you for the for your blessings. But now it's time for you to go because we're going to have some private time with God alone, which is such a lovely idea. And that's, you know, and that's why we bid, as that moment comes close, we're about to make it, if we bid them farewell so that we can continue our Shabbos meal without sort of outside observances, even if they may be spiritual, which is really, really nice. And reinforces this idea of the intimacy with God and, and that. And then we have, again, another classic, which is Eishas Chayel. This, this um, section from, uh, from Kohelet, from Ecclesiastes, um, where it talks about a woman of valor, uh, Asia Chal, right? Very, I'm sure we're all very, not, uh, sorry, not she's not Kohelet, from, from Mishli, from Proverbs. Apologies, got the wrong book of King Solomon. King Solomon, this is a chapter in Proverbs. Now, according to the Medrash, interestingly, according to the Medrash, this song was actually originally composed by none other than um, uh, the, the last chapter. It was composed by a forefather Abraham as a eulogy to his wife, to Sarah. And some suggest that King Solomon intended these words to be an ode to his, um, to his mother, which, is, which, which I found quite fascinating, um, this, uh, this measure. Um, another um, element that the measure talks about is that this is um, a, uh, the, the, in these verses, 22 verses, in these verses, they are really praises for many of the great Jewish women in history. Um, in total, as I said, 22, they found, our rabbis found allusions to 22 women, including our patriarchs, of course, you know, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Let, let, uh, and I'll share with you just a few examples. Um, one of the, one of the uh, sentences there talks about, it says, she, she girds her loins with, with strength. And, and that refers, to, they say that refers to Miriam, who gathered the strength and, uh, to, remark, to reprimand her parents for not attempting to have more children. Her parents separated, and she said, she said you're worse than Pharaoh. Pharaoh only decreed on the Jewish males. You're decreed on all children. You can't marry because they were the leaders. So they separated. There was no marriage was happening. And therefore, they weren't having children. And she said to them, you're worse than Pharaoh. And, 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 he, and they said, you're right. They got remarried. And that, after that, Moshe was born. So that praises her for her strength um, of character. And she became a leader as well, a strength of character. Um, another example is where it says, um, um, many daughters have done worthily. Um, Rabbis, um, Banas Asa Chayil, Ve'at Alit Al-Kalana, so what the end it says, Ve'at Alit Al-Kalana, that you surpass them all. And this refers, the Rabbis tell us, to Ruth, um, who merited the, to count King David as, uh, you know, in her offspring. And where it says, Isha Yiras Hashem Hittis Allah, right at the end, of a, a, a God-fearing woman is the one to be praised, that refers to Queen Esther, they say. So they, they actually find allusions to 22 um, uh, righteous women, um, and and the same medrash also applies one verse to all righteous women of all time, where it says, "Give her praise for her accomplishments." Um, Shlomo, so, um, can yeah. I can yes. I just ask a question? Yes. So there's one there's one verse that always uh, struck me as being odd in this one, which is the Noda Basharim Bala Beshivto Im Aretz. Yeah. So it's not talking about the woman; it's talking about her husband. Well, it is talking about the women because her husband. So the practice traditionally was that, that, that the um, leaders, I can't remember exactly which righteous woman that's referring to, but the leaders of, what do you mean, but Noida Bashar and Bala is known in, her husband is known in the, in the gates, because what happened at the gates, the leaders of the city used to sit at the gates for people coming to be able to, so the bet things would sit there, the rabbis would sit there, to be able to, for those traveling, to come to travel to actually ask questions and, and rule judgment, that's where the bet thing would sit. That was traditionally in the gates of the city. There were gates of the temple and the gates of the city too, so that way people didn't have to travel in too far into the city and, 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 and burden them. So it says that her husband is known in the, in the, in the gates. Uh, Noda Bashar and Bala, what's the rest of it? 
בשבטו עם זקני הארץ. What it's saying, that's actually, I found it very beautiful. Um, this is actually a compliment and an accomplishment of the woman. Saying however much the man is, because the reason the man is able to sit there all hours of the day and night to be able to be a leader of the generation is because of the wife. Because there is a woman at home taking care of the home and the kids and whatever it may be. And that is therefore, it's actually praising the woman for facilitating and enabling right. the husband to be able to do this. Right. Okay, I thank you. Which particular woman it, it, it's referring to specifically there, the Medrash says, but it's a ge generic term for all those wives of leaders who, 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 who enable their, their husbands to be able to do this and have the great name. And what do we say, right? The, state, the, the phrase in English is, the saying in English is, behind every successful man is a woman. You think that's a, a new one? That comes straight out of Eshet Chal from, the, from Proverbs, from King Solomon and probably even earlier from Abraham. who was acknowledging that, you know, behind every great or successful man is a woman. And that's no, that's no Dabba Sharim Bala, the shift on Zignaret. The husband is known because really because of her. She, she enabled it. Okay. So the last line. Yeah. Slicha, the last line. Yeah. The, the reward is the family, not Shabbat. Go on, read for me, the, remind me the last line. Tanulach. Tanulach is Prita Deha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So why do you say that is, yes, that, that is a family, not Shabbat, yeah, yeah. So we're talking about what is the greatest achievement, the greatest praise and, and accolade for a woman is, is, the, is the family, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, and, and, and throughout, of course, throughout the generations, you know, many men would praise their wives using this theme. It's become tradition, you know, very often at weddings, you'll hear people, you know, husbands singing out every Friday night. And, it, and it's almost seen as, as a husband to a wife, um, which is very noble and should be done, especially on Shabbos when the theme of peace and love is so pronounced. But that said, the source indicates that Aisha's Khal is, is, is sung at this, at this point, really primarily to tap into the sort of feminine energies of Shabbos. Now, I know that's going to, I, I imagine, sort of pique your interest and curiosity. Time just does not allow us to go into all of this the more philosophical aspect of the feminine nature of Shabbos. Why Shabbos is known as fresh Shabbos. Malkatai in the feminine is referred to as the queen. Why does it use that analogy? What is it about it? Um, and so on. That's when we do a, a series and a course, which we have done in the past on Shabbos, but have ample opportunity to elaborate on those. And you can look it up afterwards if you're really interested. Send me an email and I'll send you some links for some stuff where you can read up on it. But that, that's where the origin of this is, to try and tap into that energy um, of, of Shabbat. And we've seen some examples of, of that and uh, happy to share offline um, if time doesn't allow. So, um, where am I? In my, in my, I've lost my, oh, my notes over here. One, just bear with me a minute. Um, yes, yeah, so let's look at Kiddush now. Okay. Kiddush. So having made these introductions to Kiddush, um, where does Kiddush, what, what is Kiddush all about? So I'm, 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 I'm aware that much of this might be familiar to you, but I hope that some of this, um, when, when I say I hope it isn't, I hope only because I hope that I'm, I'm, I'm actually sharing something new, <laughs> not because I hope you don't know anything, and that, that came across completely the wrong way, but I, I'm, my hope is that in the course of some things I say, there'll be little nuggets that you might not have known about and therefore will enhance your Kiddush experience. So the Hebrew word Zachor, Um, has two meanings. It means to remember, um, which we discussed above, um, uh, and, and to mention, right? Zachar means to remember and to, to mention. And therefore, mention Shabbos to sanctify, when it says, Zachar is Yama Shabbos to the mention Shabbos to sanctify, which is in the Ten Commandments, means that we're obligated to verbally proclaim the sanctity of Shabbos, which is what we do in the text of Kiddush that we recite at the, right, at, at the onset of the meal on Friday night. Now, how is this done? Um, the, the, the core of Kiddush is really this, the mandate is, is a verbal proclamation. Um, they, the rabbi said that this should be done over a cup of wine, right? Technically, you could just make the statement and you fulfill the obligation, but the rabbi said, no, this needs to be done over a cup of wine. And I'm sure you're familiar because wine gives it importance in many cultures. It's an important drink and therefore it gives it a certain, what we call chashivut, a certain importance and status to what we're doing. And of course, we can't do wine, grape juice can be substituted. Um, for that. But on a deeper level, a deeper level, under the influence of wine, people are freer with information, right? The Talmud points out that it's, but this is further alluded to the numerical value 
numerical value of the Hebrew word for wine and secret. The word for wine in Hebrew is, of course, yayin. The word for secret in Hebrew is? Sod. Sod, yeah. Which means, um, oh, I missed the text. Uh, no, no, they actually, no, this is the text that I wanted to, yeah, okay. Um, let, let's see, um, Elizabeth, would you like to read this, this text? Yeah. On Shabbos, the innermost truths are revealed. Just as it is, so with respect to God, it is also so for us. The innermost parts of our identities are revealed on Shabbat. Hence, our sages said in Talmud Pesachim 106a, mention of the day of Shabbat to sanctify it, mention it over wine. The symbolism of wine is that it is a tool that reveals in a secret. Which is really lovely, meaning, yes, it's about idea of importance, but it, if it's the inner dimension, if what we're trying to tap into in Shabbos is our, you remember what I said earlier about the extra soul being not a second soul, but another dimension of our existing soul? So the wine reminds us that this is to just free ourselves a little bit, to, to tap into, a deep, in a spiritual way, a deeper dimension of ourselves, to allow a, 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 something a bit deeper and a bit more inner to be revealed and experienced and exposed in an appropriate way, of course, and I just thought it's so, such a lovely um, association with Kiddush, which, which hopefully brings out the significance and importance of why it is that they, that they introduce it. Um, just some technical things relating to what we do. We cover the Chala. I, now this I did discuss with you previously about sort of embarrassing, but not embarrassing the Chala, because technically Chala, sh we should be making Kiddush over Chala, because in the order of priority of blessings, that comes first. But because of this significance of why we want to do it, so we're not to embarrass the Chala, but this, remember, it doesn't have feelings. It's this message and this lesson of saying how we need to be sensitive to, to others. If we have to be sensitive to inanimate objects, a chala, then how much more so we need to be sensitive to the feelings of people around us, um, and, you know, which is very, very lovely and very beautiful. We fill up the cup and we make it um, overflow. Um, and the reason for overflowing is because it's a cup of blessing and we want our blessing to overflow during the rest of the week. A minimum of 86 milliliters, which is not a huge amount. It's about, if you imagine a, a plastic cup, uh, you know, a disposable cup is about two thirds of that. So, you know, not using that. Most, most, um, you know, bechers that we use are, are absolutely fine. Um, and as we make the, flow, the cup overflow, and we use our dominant hand. So, the right hand, we hold the right hand. Oh, um, and uh, yeah, and uh, if we're left-handed, we use the uh, the left hand. Um, we stand. The reason why we stand for kiddush is because actually kiddush is giving testimony to to God as the Creator. And when we're giving testimony, as we know, even in a court. We stand when we give testimony, and therefore that's why we stand for, um, for Kiddush. Uh, we look at the candles. When we say Sabri Maranam, during Kiddush, we look at the candles uh, because of the light and, and so on. And then we look at the wine. When we're making the actual blessing for every Agafen, we must look at the wine. And then we recite, um, we, not recite I mean, we, we um, say the actual, the next blessing is the Kiddush itself. Um, and then we, uh, everybody's around who, who's there who wants to, you know, be, be involved, uh, 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 um, have Kiddush with us, amen, and then we share it, and that's uh, Kiddush. I want to um, share, talking about sharing, I want to just say one thing about Kiddush. One other thing, which is, very, again, very, very beautiful, which a lot of people miss. Kiddush starts with um, the words, Yom Hashishi, right? Now, if you actually look into the Chumash, Yom Hashishi is the final two words of the previous verse before Vayichulu. So Kiddush says, Yom HaShishi, Vayichulu HaShemayim. So actually, the verse begins, Vayichulu is the beginning of the verse. Yom HaShishi is the last two words of the previous verse. And you'll find some Sidurim have, in small, the previous sentence, the whole of the previous, says, Vayherev Vayivoker. And some people have a custom to say it, either aloud or quietly. You should really say it quietly. You shouldn't be saying it aloud. Why? Because you can't say part of a verse. You're not allowed to. So why do you say Yom Hashishi? Why have they put Yom Hashishi there? The Yom Hashishi is for two reasons. One reason is because um, we were created on the sixth day. We were created on the sixth day. Although God created the entire universe in six days, but, but mankind was, and human beings were created on the sixth day. And therefore, that the task of bringing um, God into the open world was, is, is our task. And more particularly, by proclaiming God's presence openly in the world, then we mention the six days to highlight that the human mission, this human mission that we are accomplishing when we, sit, when we recite Kiddush. And the other thing, and, and the other way we see this is um, Yom HaShishi, if you look at the, 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 what we do by Kiddush is, you take the first four Hebrew letters, 
Yom Hashishi Vayachulah Hashemayim is the acronym of God's name. Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey is God's name. And therefore we're saying, what, what is our purpose for Kiddush? What is our purpose for Shabbos? What is our purpose in life? Is to take the physical, I'm taking wine, I'm taking something very physical, and I'm going to elevate it and make it spiritual. We bring godliness into, um, and we bring the creator into what we are doing. And that is, that is why we introduce Yom HaShishi to the, uh, to, to the Kiddush. We finish off in the last few minutes that we have with um, um, uh, Chala. So uh, you'll be very familiar with this. We have two loaves. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to race through this a little bit because, as I said, we, I, I touched on this previously. It represents a double portion of mana. There was a layer of mana on the top and on the bottom. Um, and it prevents the shame, which I mentioned. Uh, and we use, we use whole loaves. It's important to use whole loaves or whole, whatever it is we're using is whole, whole matzah, whole pita bread, whatever it is. Um, and um, we, uh, we, 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 before Kiddush, the, uh, the element over here is we must, uh, we must cover it before Kiddush. And then after Kiddush, we can uncover it. And then we wash our hands because it's something holy and spiritual for all the reasons that I spoke about washing our hands. Sorry if you weren't there at the last session, uh, but I don't have time to get through all those again. And then we cut the khala. I spoke about this. We, we score it. We cut it because we want to, there's a whole discussion about the blessing. Should you make it before the action or after? Here we, 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 we do it. We, we can, it's like a continuation. We make the blessing and then we can do it. Can um, I ask a question? Please. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I keep forgetting which way around it is, but I know oh. that we... Sorry, one second. Yeah, yeah. When we eat the hala, on yeah. Friday night we have the hala, we eat the hala that is on top. Yeah. All the way and then on Saturday we eat the one that's uh, first. That's okay, so I see, yeah. So the order is as follows. You've got the two halas on Friday night. You hold them. Sorry, I don't have one to demonstrate, but you hold them. If you imagine my hands as being in halas, you hold them one on top of the other. Right? You take the two chalas, and the one that you're going to use is the one at the bottom, which is sort of closest to, 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 to cutting. So on Friday, you use the one on the bottom? Yes. Yes. Because? Then, sorry? Because? That's the closest to the board, and the closest, that's going to, you, you're going to, otherwise you're going to bypass, if you take the top one, you're bypassing the bottom one. Right. Okay. You have to do it the closest and the quickest that's for you to do, to make the minimum, most minimum interruption. I also heard there was some allusion to women. Is that true? Could be. I'm not aware of it. Could be. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I'm, I'm not aware of it, but that's just because I'm not aware of it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So um, is, is, is... Okay, so why does it change? Simon, just bear with me. Um, on the daytime, um, so we make various changes both in Kiddush and the, and the thing. We'll, we'll talk about this next week in a bit more detail. But in the daytime, we hold them side by side and we take the right hand one because the right symbolizes kindness. But we'll talk next week about Shabbos Day and the differences in the meal and how we do things Friday night and Shabbos Day differently. Thank you. Uh, but I'm curious about the women. I'll, I'll look into that. And if you can look into it, if you find something, that would be very interesting. Thank you. Simon? Um, you've got cut there. We're rippers. Ah, okay, fine. That's a Sephardi custom. Okay, fine. That's a Sephardi practice. Um, and if you're rippers, then it, you apply the same principle, which one you rip and what you do. That's fine. Right. But but it, it doesn't you throw have it to be well, you rip it and throw it. Sorry? You rip it and throw it. My, all my family in Israel does, but I'm I'm more more sedate here. And but you're more conservative with a small C on that on that. Yeah. Part. Okay, yeah, sorry. You're more British. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, the, by the way, the ripping and throwing is, is to minimize an interruption. So it's saying that if the cutting takes too long, I'll take a piece off. So although we see it as very British, very disrespectful. So why they're doing it is actually so that you can quickly, and the throwing is because you're not allowed to pass something. If I made a blessing, somebody gives me something, I have to eat it then. If I, I can't take the bread and pass it on to somebody else, I'm not allowed. So by throwing it, you directly give it to the person who needs it because there's an order in which you give it. You give it first to your wife and then to the rest of the family. And there's a sort of an order of age that you go by that you hand the khala out and it should be taken. Some people do it on a tray. And if you're passing a tray, it's easier to do. Do you give it to your guests before your fam rest of the family? I know you give it to the wife first. I do, yeah. I, I do. I give it to guests before the children, yeah. Yeah. It's one of the only things I do for guests before children. Um, the little thing I say to them that we, we honor the guests, but, uh, but I try to prioritize children before guests in, in, in other ways. Um, but yeah. 
here. There's an interesting fact. Sorry, go on, Elizabeth. And are son in laws and daughter in laws not children? Are they guests still or are they? No, no, they're children. They're children. They become children. Uh, yeah, well, definitely. So, so you talk about in laws, there's a fascinating conversation and discussion in Halakha about um, mo mothers. If your mother and your wife, who comes first? Uh, you are on mute. I guess the wife. So right. she's the lady of the house. You are, you are right. And then, the, the, but the next question which comes, which is very particularly interesting, what if the wife says, no, you should give your mother first? So it's your mother and you've got a, a mitzvah of honoring your mother. You've got to do what your wife tells you. <laughs> very good answer. But, um, but actually, now Allah says, no, you, you still give your wife, you, you explain to her. Obviously, if she insists, you don't actually push it. But if she, and what you should respond and say, that's very kind of you, but um, no, I'd, I'd prefer to give you first and, and, and if you didn't ask. But yeah, it's an, it's an interesting d debate and an interesting thing. Okay. Um, right. Finally, um, on, just when we talk about the meal, so that was about the challah. Um, sorry, that was the last slide. So we're talking about, so let's just finish off with the meal itself. Just a couple of points relating to the meal. Um, um, I, you know, I spoke about this when we talked about Yom Tov, most of you were there. Just make sure to, to elevate it by words of Torah and singing and happiness and, and joy and all those, and just a pleasurable experience. That's really important. Um, and that's, uh, let's see what else I have got over here. Um, pleasurable, I've got a whole, uh, uh, if you have, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do this. I'm aware of the time um, and, and I've got a few things to share on, on fish. On significance of fish in general and gefilte fish in particular. If you need to go, I completely understand and go. But I'm going to continue on a few minutes because I've got a few notes I put together on 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 fish, which which has become so much a symbolism of foods and traditional foods. I just want to talk about food for a few moments. Uh, and I know we spoke about food two weeks ago, but it's in a different context because you know the key to Shabbos meal is the foods that are pleasurable. And because of that, we've we've, we've come and we've over time developed these sort of traditional foods for the Shabbos meal, a Friday night meal, and, you know, and, and, and all those sorts of things. It's amazing how attached we get to the, 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 the foods um, in this way. But certainly one of the most universal, universal things is fish. Um, and um, and, and then we've regarded that as, as particularly pleasurable. One of, the, one of the reasons for this is a, a number of different points. I'm just sort of looking at my notes to pick which one's got so much over here. Um, Okay, some of the, some of the symbolism. One of them, fish, uh, because of the fish's eyes remain forever open, and so too on, on the, we, it's almost a symbolism that on Shabbos we're reminded of God's constant eyes o o over us, God's providence um, o constantly there to remind us. Um, in addition to that, the, the, the fact that fish um, is is um, alluded to in the numerical value of the word fish. So the Hebrew word for fish is. Dark. Doug. The numerical value of Doug is seven, which again alludes is appropriate to fish for the seventh day of, of the week. Something a little bit more practical is that in order for meat to be edible, uh, it's a, quite a process you need to go through, right? You need a, a shocher to slaughter it. You need to uh, deal with the blood. The, uh, there's milk to meat. There's lots and lots of laws and practical things and how to eat it. Fish is much more straightforward and much more simple. It doesn't need all of those things. It doesn't need those practices. And therefore, it represents a state where spiritual failure is almost is impossible almost. With meat, you could get it wrong. You could do something wrong. It might not be slaughtered properly, it might not be prepared properly, it might not be salted properly, who knows? But fish doesn't need any of that. So it represents the idea of on Shabbos, we, we, we're relaxed, we're in a spiritual zone, and, and it's almost impossible um, to, to, to fail in that way if we, if we do it properly. Um, and it sort of evokes that spirit of, of, of Shabbos. I, I want to share with you one or two things specifically about kisilta fish. Right, because Ashkenazim usually, where, where did this, you know, what is this about, the filter of this? So there are a few reasons, actually, given for why we have this. Where did this develop? Where did this custom come from? So number one is a practical thing. By mixing fish with other cheaper ingredients, less could serve more people. So in the, sort of back in the home where there was much more poverty around, it was a practical thing when they were poor to be able to provide better and for it to go further. Um, the, another aspect of it is that Shabbos, requires a particular manner, manner in which edible foods need to be eaten, separating out foods that the filter fish doesn't require any separating of, of the rubbish, you know, skin or bones and those sorts of things. And therefore, it, it, we didn't need to worry about the way you ate it on, on, on Shabbos. Um, and so, so that, you know, that's one of the reasons why it became so, so, uh, so significant. And I think eating the symbolic dishes, um, you know, interspersed with 
whatever it is that in, that's enjoyable, the interactions, the sharing of, of, of Torah thoughts, of Jewish ideas, of, of inter positive interaction, and all those sorts of things, really is what makes Friday night the Friday night that it, that it is in Afghanistan. I think they've, they've just recently produced a movie, now called Friday Night, or a series, maybe a TV series or so advertised. I'm not sure how they'll be able to capture this, but there's something about Friday night, which um, even to the most you know, distant of Jews, the most non-observant, you know, that's almost the last thing to go is the Friday night experience. You know, like long before, like cold midray um, and, and Friday night, or maybe Seder night. You know, I mean, those are the three things that you know they hold on to, even if nothing else, and they don't experience anything else or, and so on. And, and I think that there's a, there's a good reason as to why it is. So in conclusion, thank you for staying with me, Sophie. In conclusion, um, but I've raced through a number of things, highlighted a number of things on Friday night. But Shabbos Day is really has a lot of spiritual significance. I didn't, I'm sure I didn't even tell you that in the beginning. And we mentioned uh, earlier the idea of an extra soul that we have, and we learned about the objective of Kiddush and the deeper symbolism of many of the Shabbos rituals, which, which I'm sure overall we're familiar with, but I hope I've been able to add another layer of meaning and significance and understanding to your practices and your experience. And we may, we may think that the entire religious experience of Shabbos should be spiritual. Like, why are we talking about Kiddush and drinking wine and eating food and gefilte fish? And like, this is the wrong thing. This is a, we're meant to be spiritual, we're meant to be davening, we're meant to be learning, we're meant to be holy, right? But as, as, I've, as I've discussed previously and a number of times, the greatest level of holiness we can achieve is by taking what's in this world and using it for God's purposes, spiritual purposes. There is no greater holy level that we can, that we can, we can have. That doesn't mean there isn't a concept of holiness of only davening and only learning. And, and, and meditating, yes, it's about, I'm not, I'm, they, they are not mutually exclusive. But what I'm saying is that in this context on Shabbat, where we are, um, at least for us mere mortals, and not sort of, you know, the, the, the handful of individuals that may you know, express holiness in a different way, regular human beings, the, one of the greatest levels of holiness we can get, we can achieve, is through eating. You know, i.e. utilizing this thing in the context of what I'm doing on Shabbat, having a, having a meal, with all of those things means I've elevated it to a point that that's what Hashem wants to do. That's why I created the world in the first place. Yom HaShishi Vayichol Hashem. He created it in order that I take the materialism, I take the, that which is there, and utilize it for a spiritual purpose. There's no greater spiritual purpose than um, Shabbat and the <coughs> are, are, are the way we bring the Shabbat experience to the body in a very relatable way. We eat lavishly, and that's good because we're doing it for a spiritual spiritual purpose and that's why we're commanded to eat on Shabbos and why even very refined people of you know even the most elevated and spiritual people need to eat and enjoy food on Shabbos which allow and that's why even you know righteous people or those who, who don't eat very much when it came to Shabbos they would eat um, much more normally because that was an, a spiritual experience in in of itself um, and, that, and, and that's what we can all achieve uh, in, in, you know, every single week I hope I've been able to enhance those experiences for your health enhance those experiences for you over what we've done today and next week we'll look at that so, so, tonight was all about friday and next week we will look at up shabbos day itself and the uh the, you know all, all that we experienced there through, through the prayers and the meals and some other things too. thank you very much thank you thank, thank you, you. And, and it was it was lovely to do oh. it without uh, internet problems absolutely you. Tell, you're telling me simon my gosh <laughs> what a relief <laughs> what a machai what a joy absolutely Absolutely. Um, and yeah, please, please do spread the word. We've got the final one coming up next week, the end of the series. Um, what happens after that, I don't know. We'll see. I've got a, a, a break of a week or two because I've got my nephew's wedding in Israel. Which sadly, we're not going to be able to go to um, the week, you know, in a couple of weeks time. It's going to be tonight and, um, and, then, uh, the week, and then the week after I'm giving a talk in Highgate. Um, they've asked me to give a talk and so it's a couple of weeks off and then we'll see see what happens through the, through the summer and we'll do, do maybe a summer series after that when all the four five weeks. But as, of, as of today, my daughter can now get married in nine weeks. Absolutely, how exciting, right? Even if it may not be in the sort of setting that would have otherwise been, yeah. but, but, we're on. <laughs> but she can get married. That's the most important thing, no question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Um, Michael, I've only sent you your message. I'll, I'll reply to you separately. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us. Just a quick question. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, the, the, you mentioned the tradition of fish for, for, for Friday, uh, for Shabbat. 
because that's yeah. always being opened. Um, where did where did chicken come into it then? And and how come another great major religion has taken on the maybe that's the reason why another religion has taken on the fish on Fridays as a concept. <laughs> Yeah, so the chicken again is a practical thing, meaning there is a concept of ein simcha ela babata vayayin, that, that you cannot have joy without meat and wine, as we discussed on the whole Shavuot conversation about we need meaty meals. But affordability was the issue. Meat wasn't in as much, you know, as great a supply as chicken was, and people, not everybody could afford it. Um, and it just stuck, even though that nowadays many more could afford meat. Um, uh, we, we, it's just become the thing that stuck. It's become the traditional dish on Friday night, which is a chicken soup and chicken dish. Um, soup was a staple diet. You had soup. So what soup? If, you, if you're anyway going to cook a chicken, then you'll use a chicken for soup and then use the chicken for later. It was, it was just literally a way of providing and making the most of the means that, that we had. And it, and it just become the nostalgic thing, even if we could change it. Um, you know, for the, on those odd occasions that some of us may have had something different for practical or other reasons, it feels strange. Like having meat on Friday night for me would feel very, very strange. Or having a vegetable soup on Friday night would feel very, very strange. And it's amazing how that, how that, you know, what that does to you. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Keep well, lovely to have you with us as ever.